Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Children's Church here at Valley Baptist Church. I'm Mrs. Rebecca, and today our lesson is called Crossing the Jordan. So last week, if you remember, we talked about how Joshua took command of the Israelites and how in that story, uh, Joshua sent two spies out to Jericho and they met a woman named, let's see if you remember, what was her name? Rahab, okay? That was the woman that they met and they made uh, an agreement with Rahab because Rahab hid them from the from the guards who came looking for them. And they told her, if you have all your family in this very house, when we come and take over Jericho, we will keep you and your family alive. Okay, so that was the deal that they made. That was what we talked about last week. Okay, so today we're talking about crossing the Jordan. Okay, and we're focusing in our Bible in, Joshua's cha in Joshua chapter three and four. And our memory verse for this week is James 2.20. It says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? James 2.20. So today we're talking about faith in action. Okay? And our theme is how we show our faith in God by our obedience to him. So my desired response from each and every one of you today is that you will demonstrate faith this week by choosing to obey one of God's specific commands. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into our story. All righty. So Joshua was ready to go. He was excited about the good report from his spies who had spied out the promised land. They told Joshua that the Lord had given them all of Canaan. This was good news after spending 40 years in the wilderness. Joshua led the massive group of Israelites seven miles toward the land God had promised to them. They had to stop, however, when they came to the Jordan River. At this time of year, the river was swollen with rapidly moving water. Now what? They knew they had to cross it to get to the promised land, but how? So all the Israelites were gathered along the banks of the Jordan River. They had their tents, their camels, their cattle, and their children. They had baskets and jugs. So if we look here on our map, okay, if you see this little sliver right here, this is the Jordan River, okay? So if you were standing on the east side of the river, okay, so on this side of the river near Gilgal, okay? I don't know if you can see it very well, but right here is the city Gilgal, okay? And they need to cross the Jordan River to get to the Promised Land, to get to Jericho, all right? so. If you were standing on the east side of the river and you had all those people and animals and items to get to the other side, what would you do? Brainstorm some ideas. What are some ways that you would get over a river or through a river? What is something that you could think of that you would do? Okay, good answers. All right. So some of the things that you might think you could do is maybe you could swim across the river or maybe build a bridge or what about making rafts to get across, right? But God had a particular way that he wanted, that he wanted the people to enter the new land. They could not just wander in however they wish. They had to obey what God told them. After three days, Joshua told the people to get ready because the Lord was going to do a miracle before them. Then he gave a command to the priests. So in Joshua chapter three, verse six, go there with me in your Bibles, Joshua chapter three, verse number six. Okay, it says, and Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, take up the ark of the covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. 
So, what were the priests commanded to do? They were to take the Ark of the Covenant, go in front of all the people. Did the priests obey? Yes, they did. They took the Ark and moved to the front of the people. The Lord told Joshua that he would make him a great leader in the eyes of the Israelites and would be with Joshua just as he had been with Moses. Joshua stood before the people and announced that the living God was with them and would drive out the enemies in the land. Behold, said Joshua, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan River. So let's look at Joshua chapter 3 verse 11. It says, Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you in, into Jordan. So the Ark symbolized the Lord himself. Who would lead his people into the promised land? Sorry, the ark symbolized the Lord himself. Who would lead his people into the promised land? So the ark was symbolizing God leading his people. Okay. So God told Joshua to give a second command to the priests. Joshua told the priests to take a few steps into the Jordan River and stand there. So the priests put their faith into action and stepped into the water, holding the Ark of the Covenant on its poles. As they stood there, something amazing happened. Now I want you to think about this real quick, okay? Because in our story at the beginning, remember I said, at this time of year, the river was swollen with rapidly moving water. Rapidly moving water. Have any of you seen a river maybe a rapid river okay like river rafting okay if you're familiar with that you're in a little boat looking thing and you're going down a river and the river's water is just it's going and you're pedaling in your boat and you're maneuvering around all the water and that's called rafting okay you're going through the waters all right so the water is moving rapidly okay but Moving water like that can also be very dangerous and very scary. So let's imagine, let's pretend that we are these Israelite priests, okay? And we have the Ark of the Covenant. We are supposed to go before the people, okay? To symbolize how, the, how God leads his people. So these priests had to be the first ones to step into the river. They don't know what's going to happen but they have to put their faith in the Lord that they will somehow be able to make it across this river. So, rapidly moving water, it's going really fast. It might be a little scary, it might be a little intimidating. Would you take the first step and put your foot in the water? I know I would be afraid that if I put my foot right there in the water, that the water would just whew, take my feet out from under me and I would fall over and continue to go down the river with all that water. So I would be scared, okay? I'm sure you would too if you were by all that water. So that's something to think about as we're reading about this story, okay? So in Joshua 3.16, let's go there in our Bibles, it says that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, that is, besides Zeratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. Okay, so what happened? Based on that verse, what happened? Go ahead and look at it one more time. Okay, so it says that the waters of the Jordan were pushed aside, okay? So because the priests obeyed, they obeyed the Lord. Um, oh, because the priests obeyed, the Lord did something unbelievable. The Bible says 
the waters coming down the river began to pile up a great distance away, thus forming one big wall of water. The waters on the other side of the priest continued flowing down and emptying into the Dead Sea. Remember, because the Jordan River connects to the Dead Sea, okay? So remember, they're right here, okay? Gilgal is right here. Let me take the map down so you can get a better picture of it. All right, here we go. Gilgal is right there, okay? And we have the Jordan River. Now they're trying to cross the Jordan River, okay? From the east side. So from this side to this side, right? And here's the Dead Sea. So as they're crossing the river, the Lord is making it so that the water piles up like a wall, almost like an invisible force field is being placed right there. So all the water just stacks up right there. And then the water on the opposite side of them is still rushing down. It's still moving towards the Dead Sea. Okay, so the waters on the other side of the priest continued flowing down and emptying into the Dead Sea. Soon a wide path of the riverbed was dry. So here's a picture, you can see. See how the water is walling up on this side? Okay, and the waters continue to flow on the opposite side. So. This is the Ark of the Covenant that the priests are carrying. Okay. So the priests were to be strong examples of trusting God. No matter how much they talked about God's power, they needed to step into the river to see it. If the priests had not obeyed Joshua's command, the other people would have wondered if the priests really believed God and may have started to doubt God's power. God's miracle was set in motion by the priests believing God's word and obeying it. So what were all the other Israelites commanded to do as the priests stood in the middle of the riverbed with the Ark of the Covenant? So in Joshua 3, 17. So Joshua chapter 3 verse 17, it says, And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. So, what were all the Israelites commanded to do? They were commanded to walk across the Jordan River, okay? To walk across the riverbed on dry ground to make it to the other side. So this was a great miracle of the Lord. So what the priests had to do was they had to one, first take the steps into the Jordan River. Remember, it was very rapid at that time. So they had to put all their faith in God and step into that river. And then, once they were in the river and the water started walling up, they were to stand there in the middle of the Jordan River, to stand there until all the Israelite people came across to the other side. So this was a great miracle of the Lord. Imagine the people who lived in that area seeing the waters of the river pushed up and out of the way to make room for millions of Israelites to cross over. The Lord did this wonderful work so the people of Israel and all the people who lived there would know that God was with the Israelites. God was going to give more commands in the days and weeks ahead. This miracle was meant to assure the Israelites that even if they were asked to do something impossible or something that did not make sense, everything would be fine if they would simply obey the word of the Lord. All right, so the Lord gave one more command on this special miracle day. Here's the picture. 
He told Joshua to command one leader from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to go back into the riverbed where the priests were still standing. The men each pick up, picked up a stone so big they had to carry it on their shoulder back to shore. Then they stacked up the 12 stones as a memorial of what God did that day. These would be stones of remembrance about God's power. So here we go. We have 12 leaders of the tribes of Israel carrying big stones over their shoulders to make a memorial so that their children and their children's children, every time they saw that memorial, they would remember what God did at the Jordan River. So many years later, young children would see this mound of stones and ask their fathers, why are all these stones piled here? God wanted the fathers to tell those children about the mighty miracle he had performed for Israel, that the Lord their God had dried up the waters of Jordan until the Ark of the Covenant and all the Israelites had passed over on dry ground. That's why we have the Bible, to remind us of all that God has done. Finally, the priests stepped onto shore with the Ark of the Covenant what do you think happened? Just as soon as the priests walked out of the river, the waters began to flow again and the Jordan River returned to normal. So obeying God allows him to show his power. And when God's power is shown, people all over the world are struck with the right kind of fear, with the right kind of fear of God and what he can do. Would you like to see God's power at work? Do you think you have faith in God? Then you must obey what the Lord says. Our memory verse will help us remember that if we really believe God, we will do what he says. So let's look at our memory verse one more time. James 2:20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? James 2.20. So let's go ahead and analyze our verse. It says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So let's look at the last statement, okay? Faith without works is dead. What do you think that means? Go ahead and brainstorm on that for a little bit. What do you think that means? Faith without works is dead. Okay, good answers. So we know that faith is when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. That is faith, okay? Because we cannot see God, we cannot see Jesus. Okay, we can't see him, but we know in our hearts because of God's word and the Bible and what God has shown us in his word that he is alive. So that is what faith is, believing in something that we cannot see. We have faith that the Lord God is alive, that the Lord God is real. That is our faith, okay, that he came down from the right hand of God and he died on the cross for our sins and he rose again the third day. That is what we believe. That is our faith, okay? So faith without works is dead. Okay, well, what are works? What are some works? What are, give me some ideas. Works. Okay, so works might be, um, doing things okay like let's let's use god's 10 commandments okay god says thou shalt not lie right okay so if we go about our daily lives with that in mind and we always think i shouldn't lie and we always tell the truth that is a work okay another work might be helping out with your mom around the house okay that is a work so Work is something that you do. It's an action, okay? So faith without works is dead. Now we know that dead means dead, right? It is no longer living. There, it, It's nothing, right? Dead. So 
faith without works is dead. So that verse is basically telling us that if we have faith, but we're not acting on our faith, we're not doing anything, okay? We're not trusting in God, okay? Then our faith is dead. If you are not producing fruits as a Christian, then you need to analyze yourself and make sure that you are doing what the Lord wants you to do, to follow a command that the Lord has given. So the, our, our Bible has many commands that the Lord has given us. And if we just follow one, we are producing works, okay? That is fruit that we are producing, okay? We wanna be Christians who are um, fruitful, okay? We don't, let's think of it like this. So let's say we have a Christian, okay? A Christian who goes out and passes out tracts, reads his Bible, tells, other about, tells others about Jesus Christ, okay let's say we have this christian and this christian has a tree and this tree is very fruitful okay it's very fruitful it's green it's growing it has fruit all around it the fruit is not rotten it's not it's not turning brown okay the fruit is good so we have this christian who reads his bible goes to church talks to others about jesus christ okay is doing all he can for the lord now then we have another Christian. And let's say this Christian believes in God. He has faith, but he's not doing anything with that faith. He's sitting around the house, playing video games all the time, or watching TV all the time, um, texting his friends, okay? And he's, not, and he's not reading his Bible, or he's not going out and sharing the gospel with his friends, okay? His faith right now, it's dead. There's nothing there's nothing producing in his tree. So his tree is a poor little stagnant tree that has no fruit, no leaves, okay? It is withered. So what Christian do you want to be? What kind of Christian do you want to be? Do you want to be a Christian that is growing fruits or do you want to be a Christian who is stagnant and who is not growing fruits and whose tree is just dead? Okay? So that is something to consider. So we also have to remember that the priests who put their foot into the Jordan River, they had faith in the Lord. And what was their work that they did to show that they had, they had faith? They took that first step. They took that first step into the river, trusting in the Lord. That was their work, okay? So we, but we also know that works alone cannot save us, okay? Good works do not get us to heaven. Only Jesus Christ can get us to heaven. We have to believe in him, okay? We have to repent of our sins. And when we, re when we repent, it's not just saying sorry, okay? Because anybody can just say sorry. It is a change of heart. It is a change of thought, a change of mind. It's the change of the way that you live your life, okay? There should be a difference in you. People should be able to see Christ in you. They should see something different in you, okay? So that is what repentance is. Repentance is turning to God and turning away from sin, okay? And it is evident in your life. So this week, I want you to demonstrate faith by choosing to obey one of God's specific commands. Whatever you want, whatever command that God lays on your heart, I want you to try and obey that command this week. Challenge yourself. Work on your faith. Be a Christian who's producing fruits. Don't be a Christian who's doing nothing and whose tree is dead. You want a tree that is alive, that is thriving, okay? So let's go ahead and work on our faith this week. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for this Sunday school hour that I have with these children, Lord God. I thank you that they tune in. I'm so glad that uh, children are enjoying them, that the parents uh, are enjoying them. I'm so happy that, um, again, that I'm able to do this, Heavenly Father. I pray that you would use me, Lord God, to... Um, to teach children about you, Heavenly Father. I pray that I would uh, be able to uh, do your will in this, Heavenly Father. 
Lord, I pray for the children out there who may not know you yet, Heavenly Father, who haven't turned to you yet. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them, Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that you would soften hearts. I pray that you would speak to the children through this, Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, guide, lead, and direct them. I thank you so much for your for your word and for, for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins, Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you for your long-suffering love towards us. I thank you for, for the Holy Spirit that you have left here to guide us. And I thank you so much for all that you have done in all of our lives, for protecting us and for blessing us with health. Lord, I thank you so much um, that, uh, that none of my family has been affected by this virus. I thank you that everybody who has been that I know of, Heavenly Father, has, has recovered and that, I, that they're doing well, Lord God. Lord, I pray you continue to keep a hedge about all the children, keep a hedge about the families of Valley Baptist Church and everybody who's watching this, Lord God. Lord, I thank you for all that you do, and I pray and ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, guys, that was our lesson for this week, and we will see you next week. Bye.